Well, good evening. This is our first international uh, webinar we've ever done. We have uh, Salish, Dr. Salish Rao in India and the uh, Canadian UU Social Justice Group is co-sponsoring uh, this webinar along with UU Animal Ministries. So we want to welcome our two co-sponsors. Dr. Sely Shrau has over three decades of professional experience and is the founder and executive director of Climate Healers, a nonprofit dedicated towards healing the Earth's climate. A systems specialist with a PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford University, Dr. Rao worked on the internet communications infrastructure for 20 years after graduation. In 2006, he switched careers and became deeply immersed full-time in solving the environmental crises affecting humanity. Dr. Rao is the author of four books, Carbon Dharma, the Occupation of Butterflies, comma, Carbon Yoga, The Vegan Metamorphosis, Animal Agriculture is Immoral, and The Pinky Promise, and an executive producer of several documentaries, The Human Experience from 2013, Cowspiracy, The Sustainability Secret from 2014, What is what the heck health 2017 uh prayer for compassion 2019 they're trying to kill us 2021 the end of medicine 2022 the land of ahimisa uh 2022 animals a parallel history uh estimated in 2023 and milked uh in 2022 Dr. Raul is a human, earth, and animal liberation activist, that group is HEAL, husband, dad, and since 2010, a star-struck grandfather. He was designated a climate hero by the Guardian newspaper in 2023, which recognized him as a foremost voice on green transition and on the true <laughs> scale of societal change required to save the planet. He serves on the Universal Meals Advisory Council of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine and on the Board of Directors of the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutritious Studies. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, you can start any time, Dr. Rao. Okay, so uh, I wanted to talk to you today about what I call the greatest transformation in human history. And to set it up, I'm going to sh I'm showing you this photograph that I took in Rajasthan, India, back in uh, 2008. I took this picture, and I had this tremendous sense of shame. At first, there was, a, there was as if I was, I had, someone had taken my glasses off and I could suddenly see. And the second thing it got was a sense of shame that I didn't see this for so long. What I saw was the fence. To the right of the fence, lush green forest. And to the left, I saw all these old cows walking around eating anything green that was growing on the ground. And I realized that my consumption of dairy was causing the forest to die right in front of my eyes. And I immediately went vegan on the spot. Okay, that was an instant transformation. Now, um, I don't know how much, how many of you are vegan, but I'm going to just give you the standard definition of what veganism is. Veganism is a way of living that seeks to exclude, as far as is possible and practicable, all forms of exploitation of animals for food, clothing, or any other purpose. That's the official definition. 
Now, by that definition, no one really wants to exploit animals unnecessarily, right? So when they say as far as is possible and practicable, it literally makes every human being with any sense of ethics fundamentally a vegan. The reason that we don't practice some of these, um, what other vegans do is because we think it's necessary or we think it's not practicable or something like that. So people come to veganism for three reasons, for health, ethics, and the environment. The difference between coming to it from these three angles, these three portals, is that it's for health, you can interact with thousands of live models and you can explore all your uh, craziest, most hidden fantasies. I think there is some interference. Okay. If you do it for health, then when you feel better, you may say, well, you know, I feel better, so I may, I, I don't mind eating some animals unnecessarily. It doesn't matter. If you do it for ethics, you may say, you know, we have been doing, we've been exploiting animals for 10,000 years. So what's the problem with waiting another 10 years or 20 years? So it doesn't give us a timeline of when we need, we need to do this by. But environment is actually telling us, you better do it by this time or else. Okay, so that's where the urgency is coming. And that's why I went vegan on the spot when I saw what was going on in the environment. Uh, the analogy I want to use is a house on fire. And this, by the way, is my house. It was my house in uh, 1993. And I didn't take this picture. A policeman took this picture. But I discovered the fire. I was in the kitchen. And my son came running out to me and my children were actually in the room right above the garage. You can see the two little windows there. And my son came running out and said, Dad, there is smoke coming out of the vents. And I was on the phone and I said, you know, the heater just came on. It was just fall. Um, and this is New Jersey. I said, maybe it's the, the new heater. It was a brand new home, by the way. And it was a brand new car. So, that, that's catching fire in the garage there. So anyway, I told him, go back and uh, don't worry about it. And he came running out again a couple of minutes later saying, Dad, there's black smoke coming out of the vents. So I went and looked and sure enough, there was black smoke coming out of the vents. And so I ran down uh, to the garage, opened the garage door and the car was spitting flames at me. And my only thought at that point was, how am I going to get my kids out of there as quickly as possible? Because there was nothing I could do about the fire. And I ran upstairs, gathered my kids, and they were just six and seven years old at that time, hit the alarm, and I ran out the door. So my first instinct was to save life as quickly as possible. Okay? I had no other thoughts in my mind. They came out, and then uh, because I hit the alarm, the police came and um, within five minutes, and the policeman came with his little fire extinguisher and he saw the fire and he realized there's nothing he could do about it either. And he started taking pictures. And the fire engine came within seven or eight minutes, you know, so they came right behind the policeman. So anyway, the fire was raging like this. Now, this is a perfect analogy to what is happening on the planet today. In 2009, so right one year after I went vegan, there was a report by the Stockholm Resilience Institute saying that there were literally three major fires on our planetary home, Earth. These are the three red uh, bars that you see in the diagram. Uh, it was climate change, nitrogen and phosphorus loading. Uh, at that time, they were just talking about nitrogen loading and biodiversity loss. Those were the three major fires that were going on in 2009. And so there were three boundaries crossed okay, in the planetary boundaries. And by 2015, they said there were four boundaries crossed. In 2023, now they're saying there are six boundaries crossed. So as if there are six fires going on in our planetary home. Okay. Now what do we do? Now, so this um, sets the framework for how we need to address this problem. And these fires are ultimately impacting wildlife. They're the ones who are dying the fastest. So between 1970 and 2010, 
52% of all wild animals died out. And this is from the Living Planet Report of the World Wildlife Fund, which is doing a co comprehensive survey of over 3,500 species. And that's their estimate. And that estimate came out in 2014. When that estimate came out, I extrapolated. I assumed that we were killing wild animals proportional to the size of the economy and extrapolated to see how many more years do we have before we wipe them all out. And the answer was 2026. Okay? And I was shocked when I made that calculation. I thought maybe, you know, uh, if that was really true, everybody would be working on this full time. So I, so I thought maybe my extrapolations were wrong. And I thought I would wait for the next report to come out. And the next report came out in 2016. So they issue reports every two years. And they are actually, their uh, data is uh, delayed by four years. So they give you the data for 2010 and 2014. And then Here's in 2016, the they said that between 1970 to 2012, 58% of all wild animals were wiped out. So at that rate, I realized that, you know, my calculations were correct, that we are on track to hit 100% um, by 2026. Now, no wildlife by 2026. Evening, Marina, could uh, you please mute? Would you mind? So sorry. Thank you. Yes. So sorry. Yeah, so that's that's what the data is telling us, right? So this is why I say there is a huge fire going on on the planet. Now, that evening, I was reading a story to my granddaughter in bed. And um, at the end of the story, she put her head on my shoulders and she said, Grandpa, who are the first human beings? And she was five years old at the time. And I was trying to figure out how would I explain evolution to a five-year-old girl? And, and I came up with this, this scenario. So I told her, imagine that you're standing on the street and you're holding your mama by your hand. And you ask your mama to bring her mama to stand by her side and so on. So you create a long line of mothers on this side of the street. And on the other side of the street, you do, you do the same thing with the chimpanzee ask her to bring her mother to stand by her side, and so on. By the time these two lines go from Phoenix to Tucson, they will merge because both lines are going to say, hey, that's my mama too. Immediately, she just sat up in bed. She said, what? Are you telling me that animals are my family? And I said, yeah, now that you put it that way, yeah, they are your family. Then she said, so then, then why are people eating my family? Grandpa, make them stop. They're eating my family. She started bawling her eyes out. And she was started naming names of people she knows who are eating her family. And I realized by trying to tell her the truth, I had created a world full of monsters for my granddaughter. So I was trying to console her. And I said, Kimaya, this is what I do. It's my job to make them stop. And immediately she stopped crying. She looked at me. She said, this is your job? This is your job? You know you haven't done your job? And then she shook her finger in my face and said, do your job. And then she told, asked me, when will you do your job? And I said, I better do it by 2026, otherwise we are all in big trouble. She said, will you promise me that? I said, okay, I'll promise you that. She said, will you give me a pinky promise? And I had no idea what it meant, but I said, okay, I'll give you a pinky promise. And she asked me to hold out my pinky and she locked a pinky in mine and said, you can never, ever break a pinky promise. And then she went to sleep. And I couldn't sleep because I realized I had made a serious promise to a little girl on behalf of our generation. And I was wondering, how am I going to keep this? And, and then I thought, who am I to make this promise on behalf of my generation? But the next morning, I woke up realizing that as a systems engineer, it's actually my job. This is really what I do. I put together systems. I put together, I understand how to create solutions for problems. And that's exactly what I was doing with the internet. So I then decided I was going to plunge into this and see what I can do, right? So this is my story okay, of what I found uh, with all my research. And now we are, you know, in 2024, and we are, it's a really urgent problem now, right? 
So that's the book I wrote, The Pinky Promise. It's about my granddaughter. And she literally opened my eyes, okay, since the day she was born. So the first picture there is when she's a month old. And when I went to see her for the first time, I was under the impression that human beings are the only species that doesn't belong on Earth. Every other species just lives and the planet thrives. And we just live and the planet dies. But she looked at me and she smiled. And with that smile, she convinced me that every human being belongs exactly as we are. We belong exactly as we are and that we haven't yet figured out who we are. Okay, So that's what I set out to understand. See, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So if, you, if I start looking at things from the perspective that humans belong exactly as we are, and you actually begin to see patterns. That's the beauty of it. And um, in nature, every animal belongs exactly as they are. Nature is such a perfect system design. You know, the elephant is breaking branches of trees, eating the leaves, throwing the branch away. Breaking another branch, eating the leaves, throwing the branch away. And you know what the elephant is really doing? She's creating an opening in the forest canopy for sunlight to stream and nourish the underbrush. Wherever the elephant trampled on bushes, she is creating new pathways in the forest for all the other animals to use. Everything the elephant does has a use, has a use in nature. So it's part of some other creature's well-being. So now to understand human beings, I want to take you back 400 million years. Okay? You need to really look far back to understand our role in the ecosystems of the planet. This is data from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change fourth assessment report. And it's showing the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere and the temperature of the earth. And how do they know the, temp well, the temperature of the earth in the form of how far ice came down in latitude? So this, can someone mute? I think there is someone who's not muted. Okay, now the reconstruction of the CO2 levels in the atmosphere shows that the CO2 levels were like 3,000 ppm uh, up to 7,000 ppm way back, you know, 400 million years ago. So there are several such proxies here. So they are showing like uh, five different proxies for the CO2 levels. And so you can see it going up and down, but when it goes down, you can see that the ice, which is shown in the blue bars, comes down in latitude. So the ice had come down to 30 latitude about 300 million years ago. Okay, And today, which is shown on the right-hand side, the ice is also down to about you know, 35 latitude, you know, 40 latitude. We are actually in the fifth major ice age in the Earth's history. And it's hard to tell that that's what we are in. And uh, um, during this time, the CO2 levels in the atmosphere have fallen really, really low. Okay? So what has happened is that as the Earth and the Sun, the solar system evolved, the Sun has gotten warmer and warmer. Over the last 400 million years, the Sun has approximately gotten 4% warmer. And as the Sun got warmer, the Earth has been shedding her greenhouse blankets, okay, the CO2 blankets. And now... The CO2 blankets are so thin that any small changes in the Earth, in the sun's um, energy input on Earth, is enough to make the CO2 levels go up and down like crazy and cause ice ages to go in and out. So the Earth has been going in and out of major ice ages for the last three million years. Okay, the white line represents the temperature of the Earth. And the blue lines represent the CO2 level over the last 650,000 years. And this reconstruction was done by drilling through the ice core in, the, um, in Greenland and slicing the ice core layer by layer and analyzing the air bubbles. And what it shows is the temperature has been going up and down by as much as 10 degrees Celsius. If you look at the highest point here and the lowest point here, the difference is about 10 degrees Celsius. Okay. And when the temperature is low, you're in an ice age. 
when it reaches the peak, you're in a warm period between ice ages. And roughly every 100,000 years, it goes in and out in a periodic uh, fashion. And this is caused by very small variations of about one watt per square meter in the amount of sunlight that falls on Earth. It goes from 130 to 131, and it causes this to happen. So during this time, the Earth spawned us as a species. And we are a very ordinary species. We don't run too fast. We don't climb trees too well. We don't see too well. We don't uh, hear too well. We don't smell too well. We are easy to catch. So we were born as a prey species. This forced us to figure out how to control fire, to use our brains. So we were given control of fire about 500,000 years ago. That allowed us to survive as a species and become a little bit more powerful as a species. And then 50,000 years ago, we formed partnership with wolves who became our dogs. And that was during a cold period. You know, this is an ice age. And 50,000 years ago, we formed partnership with wolves, which allowed us to migrate out of Africa and go to every part of the world as an invasive species. Okay. Then comes the current warm period, which is shown on the right-hand side. And you can see the current warm period, the temperature looks exactly like the temperature that uh, three ice ages ago, so the two red circles, you can see that they're roughly the same. But instead of going back to the ice age again, the temperature has sort of stayed flat and it's now gone up a bit. And if you look closely at what happened there, you'll see that the CO2 levels matched what was happening three ice ages ago until about 6,000 years ago. So the red dots are the current warm period and the blue dots are the warm period from three ice ages ago. You can see it matched it roughly until about 6,000 years ago and then it takes off. Same with the methane levels. It matched what was happening until about 5,000, 4,000 years ago and then it takes off. And that's what William Rediman calls the human effect. We did this. Our ancestors did this. So they migrated out of Africa, went to every part of the world, and then they started agriculture everywhere, and they heated the earth. They heated the earth. So if you look at the temperature of the earth 20,000 years ago, it was really cold. It was in an ice age. And then 11,700 years ago, it went above the glaciation threshold. So the Great Lakes started forming. Then... The temperature would have gone back to the ice age 5,000 years ago, except our ancestors kept it flat by burning down forests, starting agriculture, raising animals for food. And all these things allowed us to keep the earth warm. And that allowed the conditions for agriculture to happen. And then 200 years ago, we discovered fossil fuels and we used it to burn, and we burned it, and we increased the temperature now by about 1.4 degrees Celsius. And now we are at a decision point where we have to decide whether to continue heating the climate. And if we do that, if we continue heating the climate, uh, William Rediman is showing that we will all die off by, you know, when the temperature hits about four degrees Celsius, and then the earth will go back to the ice age again. So in his projection, humans are going to be extinct and the earth will be back in an ice age, you know, uh, maybe a thousand years from now. The other possibilities is that if you increase the temperature to by about four degrees Celsius, you could get runaway climate change and Mother Earth could die, you know, because anything that's alive eventually dies and Mother Earth could die. So the Earth will become a dead planet and, you know, maybe there's some other life somewhere else, right? So that's the second possibility there. But both of those possibilities, to me, are not attractive for us as a species. What is attractive for us as a species is that we consciously start cooling the climate. And that's what I call the greatest transformation in human history. It's a transformation from a climate heating civilization to a climate healing civilization. And this great transformation will be greater than the industrial revolution, the agricultural revolution, the scientific revolution, or any other revolution you can think of. And probably even greater than the discovery of fire. Because to achieve this greatest transformation, we have to discover the spiritual fire within ourselves. 
So how do you go from heating to healing? We have a system that's based on deception, domination, death, disease, and destruction. And we have to now create a system based on honesty, humility, happiness, health, and harmony. Deception. I want to show you the picture right behind this. I mean, is the satellite picture of the Amazon deforestation. And you can see in the deforest, they leave clumps of trees behind. And I discovered they did that, they do that because according to UN conventions, any one kilometer by one kilometer grid that has 10% tree cover is still, is still considered a forest grid. So officially, there is no deforestation that has happened here because a forest grid has remained a forest grid. That is what I call deception. Of course, it's not good for wild animals when you do things like this. So the solution, how do you go from heating to healing? The solution lies in how we use land today. Okay, if you look at how we use land today, and this is data from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, I have just you know, looked at the numbers here and I map, put it on a map so that we can understand better these bar graphs that they show. So in the map, this is how we use the earth today. Okay. If you take all the land that we're currently using for timber and paper, these are managed forests, and if you put it in one spot, it'll cover all of North America, all of Central America, and a little bit of South America. That's timber land on the left here. The original forest, if you put it all in one spot, it'll cover the bottom half of South America. It's only 9% of the land area of the planet. The rest is now given up for the other purposes. Okay. If you were to take all the land that we're using for biofuels and put it in one spot, it'll cover the bottom half of South Africa. If you take all of our cities, all of our railroads, all of our highways, the airports, all the built land and put it in one spot, it'll cover Madagascar. A little bit more than a little bit more than Madagascar, but just roughly Madagascar. So the rest is for our food system. If you take all the land that we're using to raise our uh, crops or uh, vegetables and our grains and our nuts and seeds, all the plant foods that we eat, and we put it in one spot, it'll cover Australia. And it's actually giving us 85% of the food we eat by dry weight. Okay? Only 15% comes from animal sources. 12% comes from land animals. And to grow that food, we are using land that will cover all of Europe, most of Asia, and a little bit of Africa. And I put the deserts in between because to raise animals for food, we are actually cutting down forests and turning forest land into grazing land. And when you do that, and then you constantly burn down anything that's growing uh, in order to maintain that grazing land, these are called pasture maintenance fires, Eventually, that land becomes deserts. The deserts are caused by animal agriculture mainly. Okay? So if you did that, you'll see the deserts are in the middle. And so totally, for 12% of the food we eat, we are using 43% of the land of the planet today and another 19% that we have desertified. So the remaining 3% of the food comes from the ocean for which we are bottom trawling an area the size of South America every year with industrial fishing. And that only gives us 3% of the food we eat. Now, if you were to do this to the earth, move all the, you know, manage that forest to one place, move all the original forest to one place and, you know, do the division like I've shown you here, you will notice that most of the trees are only in the Americas. There are hardly any trees in the rest of the world. So in the last 10,000 years, we have cut half the trees on the planet. There used to be five to six trillion trees. Now there are only three trillion trees. So when we, if we go vegan, if the world goes vegan, okay, we need to just, instead of 85% being from plant foods, we have to get 100% from plant foods. So for that, we need maybe another 3% of the land area of the planet which means you can return 40% of the land area of the planet back to nature 
if we do not use animals for food. Then you can return the entire ocean back to nature. Together with the 40% of the land, the entire ocean, that's like leaving 80% of the earth alone and giving it back to nature. Okay? And if you do that, the good news is that all six of these planetary fires you can put out. All of them you can put out. So let's look at the East Planetary Fire in detail. The least violated transgression, the least, the smallest planetary fire is freshwater change. Okay? And if you return 40% of the Earth back to nature and restore the forests on that land, you will restore the water cycle of that planet. And so you will return the fresh water back to the wild animals so that they can thrive. Land system change, that's the next one. If you return 40% of the land back to nature, that fire will also diminish. It will go back from red to green. The third is climate change. There again, if you restore the three trillion trees that we cut, you can literally reverse climate change. Okay? I guarantee you that. If you put back another three trillion trees on the planet, climate change will be gone. Then comes the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles. And this is because of uh, the fertilizers that we use. And half the crops that we are raising is to feed animals. And if you don't have to feed animals, then you can cut down on the crops we are raising by a large amount. So, so all those fertilizers that we're using to grow crops can be re reduced. So this red will also go towards the green. I don't know if it'll hit green, but it'll go towards the green. Then comes novel entities. And that's the chemical pollution that we put into the planet. So we are pouring 250 billion tons of toxic chemicals into the environment every year for our consumer activities. Okay, That's 30 tons per person per year. That's 30,000 kgs of chemical pollution. And that is all around us. It's in the water, it's in the air, it's in the trees. And when we go vegan and we replant 3 trillion trees on the planet, those trees are going to suck up that chemical pollution and store it in their trunks. Because that's what trees do. Trees are amazing life forms. They take water and they filter the water. They store all the pollution in their trunks and they transpire clean water, fresh water, pure water through their leaves. Secondly, when we start eating only plant foods, we will get only one to 10% of the chemical pollution that we currently get in the animal foods that we eat because of bioaccumulation. So when we go vegan, we clean up chemical pollution both on Earth and for ourselves. Finally is biosphere integrity. is the biggest fire, the biodiversity loss. And there again, when we return the entire ocean and 40% of the land back to nature, we can restore wild animals. Okay? And that will also diminish that fire. This is why I say just one single act, going vegan, can address all six planetary fires. And the climate system is also ringing six alarms at the moment, saying, you better start cooling, otherwise I'm going to kill you. I mean, it couldn't be any, get any clearer than that. Okay? There are six uh, nonlinear feedback loops that have been estimated to be triggered in the less than two degrees range, 1.5 to two degrees range. We are already at 1.4. So we are close to triggering them or some of them may have been already triggered, we don't know. This is why to address these six alarms, you have to, in, you know, as if the house is on fire, you have to get up and act and do something different from what you've been doing. See, what happened to me, to me when my, fire, my house got fired is that I wasn't thinking of my, about my routine of making coffee or breakfast or whatever. I was interested in getting my kids out of there and getting the heck out of there, right? Same way now. You know, when you see the planet is on fire, we need to change our routines of what we're doing. And when you take into account the land use and how we are using land and what we could do on that land, I wrote a paper showing that animal agriculture is the leading cause of climate change, responsible for at least 87% of greenhouse gas emissions on an annual basis. Now, with the sixth assessment report and the new data that's come in, I am able to update that from 87% to 118%.
Now you may think, how the heck can it be greater than 100%? What I mean by that is that if we go vegan, if the world goes vegan, and we are still driving around in cars and flying around in planes and you know doing all our other activities as we do today, you will see the CO2 level in the atmosphere come down year after year. That's why it's greater than 100%. Because nature will start healing. And to show that, I, I um, took human activities and separated it into two. Burning machine is all the consumer activities that we do with the fossil fuels. And the killing machine, which is everything we do with uh, killing animals and trees. Okay? So you, we kill like one to three trillion sea animals. We kill like 90 or 80 billion land animals. And we kill tens of billions of trees every year. So all that activity requires energy. And so I looked at the human activities as these two machines. And then I created a model. This is what engineers do. Okay, I'm a systems engineer. I created a model showing how our two machines are impacting climate change. So I call it the climate bathtub model. In the bathtub, there is a baby sitting in a bathtub and there is 1,100 liters of water in the bathtub. So it's, this corresponds to the 1,100 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent that we have added to the atmosphere since 1750. And the bathtub is filling up with two faucets. The burning machine is pouring 35 liters per minute. That corresponds to the 35 billion tons of CO2 we add to the atmosphere every year. So one liter is like one billion ton of CO2 and one minute is like one year, right? And the killing machine is pouring 15 liters per minute into the bathtub. So it's less than the burning machine. This is why everybody focuses on the burning machine. They say, oh my God, we have to turn off the burning machine and ignore the killing machine. But that's actually a big mistake because the burning machine is connected to the aerosol tank. For every one liter per minute that you turn off the burning machine, it opens up the aerosol tank and allows 10 liters to pour out of the tank into the bathtub. So that aerosol tank represents the cooling gases that we put into the atmosphere when we burn fossil fuels. And they, the cooling gases are masking about one third of the heating so far. This is why it's 350 liters in the, in the aerosol tank, which is roughly one third of the 1100 liters in the bathtub, okay? So if you turn off the burning machine right away, you will let 350 liters pour out of the tank into the bathtub and the baby will drown. Because I'm assuming that the baby drowns and the water level in the bathtub goes above 1200 liters roughly 10% more CO2 than what we have added so far. So the killing machine faucet is connected to the drain of the bathtub. So for every one liter per minute that you turn off the killing machine faucet, it opens the drain and allows three liters per minute to pour out of the bathtub into the tank below. So this tank represents the potential of reforesting all the land that we are currently using for animals and what that would do to the CO2 level in the atmosphere. And the, when you turn it off completely. So if you turn off the killing machine completely, you're going to remove this 15 liters from pouring into the bathtub and you're going to open up the drain and allow 45 liters to pour out of the bathtub. So now you have 35 liters pouring in, 45 liters pouring out. The bathtub level in the bathtub will come down by 10 liters every minute. That's what I mean by saying that the CO2 level will come down in the atmosphere if you shut off the killing machine, okay? So right now, if you don't do anything, there is 50 liters pouring into the bathtub, but if you shut off the killing machine, there is 10 liters pouring out of the bathtub. That's an equivalent of 60 liters being taken out. That's 120% of 50 liters, and that's where the 118% comes from. So as an engineer, if you ask me how would we solve this problem, I would say shut down the killing machine as soon as possible, like right now, and then slowly turn off the burning machine faucet. Okay? Because as you shut off the killing machine, as the water level comes down, then you can turn off the burning machine slowly and drain the aerosol tank. Instead, what our governments have been doing, they've been focusing on turning off the burning machine and not doing anything about the killing machine. Okay? 
And they actually, the reason we have had this warm spell over the last six months, according to Johansson, is because they, they turned off. I mean, they actually let some water out of the aerosol tank by regulating how much sulfur can be burnt by ships. They cut it down. Okay, And so in essence, now the aerosols are not being put into that, in my, to the atmosphere. And we got some heating from that. So I see this as the equivalent of what happened in World War II. Okay? Remember uh, when Hitler was in his bunker during the last few months of the World War, World War II, he was saying, I will never surrender. You know? He was sitting in an underground bunker saying, I will never surrender. And he was moving imaginary armies around. And the elites who were with him in the bunker were having parties. Whereas right outside the bunker, people were dying. Okay. And to me, that's exactly what's going on now. This is the downfall of the heating civilization. There's a panic right now in the bunker. Okay, People are running around. and But then our leaders are saying, we will never ever change the economic growth paradigm. Capitalism forever, right? We'll never ever change that. And the elites are partying. Yeah, um, Mark Zuckerberg is advertising his his high quality steak in which he's feeding his cows macadamia nuts, but he's got a bunker okay, in Kauai where he can hide. And meanwhile, there are people who are being flooded out of their homes, and they are getting into whatever they could find. And this is, there are houseless people everywhere. I mean, it's just a mess in the world, right? And you cannot tell them, hey, why don't you use Google Maps and find where you're going? And no, they're desperate. This is why we need this massive transformation. And this transformation to me is about, actually, it's good for everyone, right? Right now, we're in a situation, we've got what I call the climate heating phase, which I call the ego civilization, where man is above woman, is above animals. And basically, man is bullying everyone, right? And bullies are actually cowards, right? I mean, bullies are doing it out of fear. That's the ego. It's a separation from nature, thinking that we don't belong in nature. And when you realize you have belonged all along, that you are doing something that nature always wanted, which is to heat up the climate and prevent the earth from ever going back to another ice age again, then you can get into the climate healing phase, which is what I call seva, where man and woman are here to serve the wild animals, to bring them back, to restore the ecosystems of the planet. So that's why this is shaped like a heart. This is love, okay? loving nature, loving, loving wild animals. And then once you restore them and you stabilize the climate, then you can get into the eco phase where everyone is equal. That's what I call the climate harmonizing phase. So this is where I, I use the analogy of the butterfly, because this is the caterpillar turning to the chrysalis, turning to the butterfly. But that base, the foundation of this climate healing phase is a vegan world. The current system unfortunately, is trying to maintain itself. And our leaders are all trying to maintain the current system. And uh, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine pointed out that there are eight risky behaviors that are responsible for 15 chronic diseases, chronic conditions that are responsible for 90% of total costs worldwide. And these eight risky behaviors are poor diet is number one, physical inactivity, smoking, lack of health screening, poor stress management, insufficient sleep, poor standard of care, and excessive alcohol consumption, in that order. And according to John, Dr. John McDougall, poor diet is responsible for more than half of these costs alone. Okay. Now, in the current system, these eight risky behaviors are encouraged in the system because it's responsible for 90% of the healthcare economy. And we are always trying to grow the economy. And so this is why we are in a perverse situation where we are 
increasing the death for animals, we're increasing diseases for human beings, and we're increasing the destruction of the planet in order to grow the economy. And it is a social justice issue. Way back in between 1800 and 1945, uh, India went through 25 famines and almost 100 million people died from famines. And these are man-made famines, mostly. And the purpose of the famines is to persuade Indians to migrate out of India, go to different parts of the world and become laborers for the colonizing power. Okay? That's what I call colonialism 1.0. Colonialism 2.0 is we feed them unhealthy diet okay, and make it um, make food deserts in places where people cannot eat it, eat healthy food, and thereby essentially doing the same thing, killing them off and using their bodies for making profits. Yeah. That's what I call colonialism 2.0. And that's what's going on now. But those of us who have choices, who can choose to eat healthy food, now have a responsibility to overcome those eight risky behaviors and heal ourselves. You know, um, But to make sure that people eat unhealthy food, poor diet, our system lies to us. And one of the biggest lies is protein. They'll tell you that only animal foods are protein. And we teach our kids that in schools. That's a lie. Here is a laboratory analysis of amino acids in different foods. And you will see there's hardly any difference in the amino acid profile between plant foods and animal foods. In fact, all plant foods have all amino acids. This is from a paper by Gardner et al. from 2019. And there are over... I don't know, 100,000 foods that have been analyzed, and you can go verify this in the University of Minnesota database. And the next thing is to persuade people to consume dairy. I mean, in schools, everywhere. It's like this, the, the, our government is determined to push dairy on people, on children. And if you look at the percentage of lactose intolerance around the world, you will notice there's only Europe and North America that have the lowest frequencies, and Australia. Lowest frequencies of lactose intolerance, zero to 20%. Every other part of the world is very high. In fact, India is 60 to 80% of the people are lactose intolerant. And yet our government, the government in India is pushing dairy. I mean, who are they working for? You know? 60 to 80 percent of the people cannot even digest it. And so in, even in uh, North America and Europe, it's the people of color who cannot digest this. And yet they're forced to drink it in schools because that's the only thing that's subsidized by the government. So this is what I mean by colonizing power. You know? But you cannot solve this problem until you change the goals of the system. Meaningful reforms are not possible until goals change. And in the UN, Sustainable Development Goals, I have made a change to the Sustainable Development Goals that would solve the problem. Okay? The Sustainable Development Goals, they're all good goals. No poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education. I mean, who could argue against any of these goals? And yet we haven't been able to meet these goals because there was a Trojan horse of a goal. That's goal number eight. That was economic growth. And I say, if you have no poverty, if you meet zero hunger, if you meet good health and well-being, who the hell cares whether the economy is growing or not? The only person who cares whether the economy is growing or not are those who are running the Ponzi scheme. So they are pretending to meet all the other goals by just growing the economy. They are running a Ponzi scheme. I say, just see it, say it, See for what it is. It's a Ponzi scheme. So forget the economic growth. Let's meet all the other goals. And instead of goal number eight, I say zero animal exploitation is a good goal to have. Because if we want to restore the wildlife population of the world, we have to serve the animals. And to serve the animals, you don't have to serve them on a platter to each other. Okay? So that's why zero animal exploitation is a very good goal to have. 
So that's goal number 18. So replacing goal eight with 18 will make all these goals easy to meet. And we have to heal ourselves first, heal humanity so that we can then do the work of restoring the ecosystems of the planet. To do heal humanity, do the opposite of the eight risky behaviors. From poor diet to healthy vegan diet, from physical inactivity to regular exercise and yoga, from smoking to conscious breathing or pranayama, from lack of health screening to regular health routines, from poor stress management to meditation and awareness, from insufficient sleep to adequate rest and sleep, from poor standard of care to a sense of purpose, and that we have now because we have a purpose as a species, from excessive alcohol consumption to contact with nature, and that we'll get when we go to the healing civilization. From heating to healing, there is an infrastructure upgrade that we need to do in everything. Education system has to be upgraded. And it's, of course, about first telling this story to everyone. That's the first education we need to do. The second is to heal ourselves, put on our own oxygen mask first so that we can do the other work. Third is vegan sustainable development goals as opposed to the uh, UN sustainable development goals. Fourth is we need to create a constitution for how are we going to organize ourselves when we are restoring the ecosystems of the planet. That's the codes for a healthy earth. Then we have to do vegan donut economics, where we stay within the bounds of the planet. So it's a different economic system that we have to build. And we have to rewild the planet. That's the sixth one. And the seventh is vegan spirituality, where we um, bring the religions of the world together. So these are the seven strategic initiatives that we are working on at Climate Healers. And this is how you would upgrade the infrastructure of the civilization from heating to healing. And it requires us to change the money game. Because in our current money game, which is really a Ponzi scheme, there is always more debt than money at any given point in time. And the money is being used to extract more and more from the planet in order to return the debt. And that is the root cause of all of this heating that's happening. So if you want to create a healing civilization, you have to change this game. And we have proposals for how to change the game. So it's not that hard to figure out, okay? Because there's a simple rules in the game that we need to change and make it so that everybody thrives on the planet. Uh, I'm actually teaching a course on the Bhagavad Gita, which uh, I, where I explain how to act effectively when you go from heating to healing. How can you be the most effective human earth animal liberation activist? So anyone is welcome to join. You can register at this link, climatehealers.org slash Gita class, because it has universal rules, I mean, universal lessons for all of us, no matter which religion you're in. Uh, I participated in a debate at Oxford Union, which is the premier debating society in the world. And I'm happy to say that the vegans won the debate. Okay, 112 to 84. And this is my granddaughter now. And you can see she's holding the, uh, the I card saying that we won. So, and she drew this illustration to explain uh, what has happened so far. So our ancestors began this journey 500,000 years ago, okay? It's been a marathon. They suffered so much to get us to where we are. And now we are, 14 feet from the finish line of the marathon. Okay? 26.197 miles out of 26.2 miles have been completed. But you have to make a U-turn to get to the finish line. You have to just change everything and make a U-turn. And our generation has to do this. But if you go straight, there's a McDonald's instead of making a U-turn. And there's a clown outside McDonald's saying, hey, come, come, come. And if you follow that clown, if you go into McDonald's, he's going to kill you. Not only you, he's going to kill all our children and our grandchildren too. So what are we going to do? Are we going to make the U-turn? And I think, in my opinion, it's a no-brainer. We're going to pull this off. Thank you all for inviting me. And, you know, have faith. 
this is a beautiful story that we are all on. It's a beautiful journey that we are all on. And every one of us belongs in this journey. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rao. Yes. Yeah. Applaud it. <laughs>